Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today for um, the first of um, our webinar series. Just letting you all know that um, we're recording this session so that we can uh, make it available afterwards um, for everyone and, and others who might want to view it. So look, uh, thanks very much for taking the time out today. I'm just going to share my presentation there. I've got it on the screen, but I'm just going to put it into slide mode and I'm just going to turn my video off because it's been playing up a little bit. All right, so. All right, so the Strategic Local Government Asset Assessment Project. Um, that's what we're going to be focusing on today, um, but You've probably seen the list of webinars that we're doing in this series. So as you can see on the screen there, there's there's a number of uh, webinars we're going to be covering over the next couple of weeks, um, basically looking at a session on Tuesday and Thursdays. And we'll give you some details about that second one there, Base Vehicle Bridge Interactions, um, at the end of uh, today's uh, webinar. So that's the series that we're going to be doing. And I guess we see this as fairly important in terms of not only um, providing some, I guess, a bit of an introduction to um, our project, um, uh, looking at the at the asset assessments, and um, Neil Lake will be joining us to to run through a lot of those those details, um, but also looking at how we actually then link this back to access decision making, um, and that's a really really important component of what we're doing in this project. So I'll keep moving on. So quickly, just to introduce ourselves, um, I'm Todd Wellard. I'm the project manager of the Strategic Local Government Asset Assessment Project. Um, very brief history. I've been with the, with, uh, the National um, Heavy Vehicle Regulator now for over six years. Um, so fair bit of experience in this space um, and certainly have been uh, working in this particular um, area around this project um, over the last 18 months um, and certainly found it a really good exercise and certainly uh, keen to keep going in this particular space and try and get some some more um, outcomes for local government. Um, Neil, as you can see there, Dr Neil Lake, um, who will be picking up in the session after um, I've done a bit of an outline around the project. Um, Neil, as you see there, is the Director of Engineering Practice at um, the Institute of Public Works Engineering Australia, Queensland. Um, so you'll get to hear Neil um, in a moment talk a little bit about his his um, history and, and what he's currently working on and how he's assisting the project. All right, so just a quick outline of today. Um, uh, gone over our welcome. As I said, I'll give a bit of an overview about what the project's about um, and also I guess some of the outcomes that we're we're achieving um, at this point in time. Take you through that and then Neil will take over and talk about the asset assessment process as well as I think a pretty important piece was a, which is around looking at asset assessments, the tiers of assessment versus levels of inspections, which you're probably familiar with. So subtle, but actually quite uh, a distinct difference in terms of what they are. So Neil will run through that. At the end of it, we'll look, we, we're, we've got a fair bit of material to get through today, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. Probably the best way to approach this is um, you can you can put your questions into the chat um, in the webinar. We will try to get them to them at the end. Um, if we don't get through them, um, we'll we'll provide those answers to you uh, post the webinar. All right, so let's kick into it. The Strategic Local Government Asset Assessment Project. I no doubt some of you are familiar with it because I'm sure you're participating. Um, but effectively what's happened here is the Australian Government has provided funding to the NHVR to assist local government road managers um, with assessing their infrastructure assets um, with a particular focus on bridges and culverts. And I think we all know um, in terms of making access decisions, this has been an area that certainly has been, you know, difficult because we don't know a lot about um, uh, the carrying capacity of our assets, particularly as a lot of them were designed and built a number of years ago. And of course, there's a lot new, lot of uh, new vehicle configurations on the network these days. So it's, it's an important uh, project and it's good to see the Australian government supporting it by putting the funding specifically for local government. 
So I guess uh, to to put it simply, four key areas that we're looking at. Um, obviously, there is a, a desire um, from the Australian government to improve access for heavy vehicles across regional freight routes. Um, th and that, that's an interesting one because, again, just because we go and do assessments doesn't mean it necessarily opens up the network. What it does do, though, is provide a greater understanding of our assets and therefore where heavy vehicles should run. So I think that's a really key point around that one. It's not just about opening up the network. Um, you know, it has to be done in, in, a, in a managed way. We can talk about uh, that in some of the upcoming webinars a bit more. Um, a focus on, you know, connecting our, our, our regions and particularly um, not only within regional areas so that we've got that local network and local economy functioning well, but also into the, the, the jurisdictional network as well. And that's really, really important. Um, Again, another one, and look, this is you'll you'll hear soon about some of the work we're doing here, but building building capacity within local government to undertake risk based assessments and looking at how we optimize the use of the network for heavy vehicles. So again, we've we've we're doing a lot of work in that space in order to provide some opportunity for all local government road managers to increase their understanding in the space. And obviously these webinars are part of that process. Um, and then also, what do we do with all the information that we that we produce through the project? Um, if we if we make it available um, to stakeholders such as road managers as well as um, operators within industry, then surely sharing that information um, can assist in streamlining the process and also um, getting a better understanding of. I guess some of the considerations on the road manager side, but also on industry side as well. So there are some. Uh, there are. Yeah. I'm on a team meeting. Sorry, um, could you just mute, mute your microphone there? Thank you. Um, so in terms of um, what we're doing at the moment, um, the these maps here, hopefully, I, I'm sure you can't make out the absolute detail, but we've done two rounds of assessment of assets. Um, Hi Todd, we've just lost your sound there. If you wanted to uh, reconnect. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Okay, apologies for that. Not sure what happened there. Technology. <laughs> All right, so, um, as I was saying, these are the two rounds of assessments that we've done, and we're just completing um, round uh, round one at this stage. In summary, between the pilot and, and round one, uh, we've done about 330 um, assessments across 74 local government areas, um, which is great. So we've we've obviously gone out, we've we've engaged external suppliers to undertake these assessments and they provide a report at the end of that process as to looking at a set of vehicles and to see um, what, what the results are around that vehicle travelling across those particular assets. Now, there's a fair bit of, I suppose, at the end of the day, when we do those assessments, what does it all mean? And I think the key here is around interpreting those results. So a couple of examples here that we've, that we've looked at, um, one with Bega Valley, where we've got a, a particular bridge there um, constructed in 1968, five span bridge, 150 metres long, steel girders supporting a concrete deck. So we've done a tier two assessment. And as I said, Neil will talk um, a little bit later on around what the different tiers of assessment are. But what that's done is they'll identify that there's capacity within the structure to allow a double milk, milk tankers um, across that asset, which is great because there's there's definitely a need there and, and vehicles were having to go further around. So that's cutting down that trip for them, um, which is a great outcome. 
Um, another one, uh, Lilyvale Road Bridge um, in the Central Highlands area, uh, yeah. a bridge that was constructed in 1978, T44 was the design. Um, you see there, that's a 44 tonne semi-trailer that that's been designed for. And as a result of, the, of, of those assessments, the council has moved to um, add five routes onto their pre-approvals in that area. So that streamlined that process as well. So that's the sort of thing that we look at when we get these results. We, we work with the council to actually understand what those results mean and how we can then apply it to our you know, heavy vehicle access process. The other part that we've done, which is really, really important, is around building the work that we've done and the results into a system, I suppose, that's accessible for everyone. So one of the requirements that the Australian government had was around a central database. Um, so when we had a look at this, we felt probably the best place for us to do that work would be in the NHVR portal, because both road managers and the industry use the road manager portal. Um, it's where we make our decisions. It's where the operators, um, you know, create their applications. And we've got a lot of information in there that supports that process. But what we felt was important was to create some capability. And one of those was around building in an asset layer for local government assets, focusing on bridges and culverts initially. And what we've done, as you can see from these images here, we've created this new layer um, in there. And for the assets that we've assessed, which are, you'll see there, the little orange dots um, across, littered across the map, um, we've then added in some details around each of those structures and um, added in the results of those reports. And what's interesting, I know you, you probably can't see the detail of that, that report there, but Essentially, what we're presenting is the detail across a number of vehicle configurations and across each of the axles within that um, configuration. So I guess that gives us an appreciation of just how much information um, is contained in these reports. And there's a bit of a process to go through to make sure that we understand that. But effectively, we've created that layer. It's now live and you can see see this information in there. And you know, as we complete our round one, um, assessments, which is around another 200. We'll work through with the councils and um, we'll then um, upload this information into the portal um, against those assets. So that's one aspect that we're doing in the system. The other part that we've done here is we've built the capability because there is no uh, national or central database for asset data and the current process of providing that data through to jurisdictions and then through to us is quite a clunky process. And not only that, it's it's generally, there's quite a lag of a couple of months, generally before we get that information. So the information in our system is out of date. We've built this capability here and you can see just from the images on the screen, that allows you as road managers to actually go in and input data around your assets directly into the system. So you can, in, you can, you can upload that um, individually or you can do a bulk upload. So that'll allow us to start building up, um, I guess, that database around all the different assets. And the beauty of it is that, you know, you as the road managers are the ones who can put that in there. You can then keep it up to date, you know, as, as different things change around a particular structure. Having that there then does actually allow us some ability to then work towards some of the, I suppose, the capability we're building, which is a little bit of a, a, a teaser here, but um, what we're looking at developing is a rapid assessment capability, and we want to build that into the portal. We've already done some work in this round, and we've got a prototype um, of that particular tool that's just been delivered to us, and we're now going to go through a process of testing that out. At the end of that process, what we want to do is build that into the portal. So having that asset data in the portal um, for your assets will help facilitate the use of this tool. So that's something that, that we just wanted to give you a bit of an idea in terms of what's, what's coming um, over the next six months. I think that's going to be a real, real improvement and allow you guys to be able to effectively when you get an application coming in for consent, you can have a look at the vehicle and you can put it through 
the assessment tool and and uh, see what it tells you about whether that that vehicle's able to travel. So I think that's a pretty exciting change and hopefully will make make life a bit easier. But I guess the key point I'll make there is it's all dependent on having the data about the particular asset. If we don't have the data, we can't do a rapid assessment and that's really, really important. So that's something we need to work on. So that's our that's our system capability that we're building. So if, if you're in the NHVR portal, you'll and you go to the layers and see that local government layer. You can also go in there and see some of that capability we've built around uploading your assets and you can start to do that now. All right, <coughs> excuse me. The other part we've been working on in terms of building capability, um, obviously these webinars are a part of that process, but this is really, this series is a bit of an introduction, I guess. We're doing more work in this space and um, effectively we've got a, a road manager toolkit that we're building, which will consist of a whole heap of resources for you that will allow you to better understand how asset assessments are undertaken and look at how we actually connect that process into that, as I said, the access decision making process as well. So that's all being built. You can see the link at the bottom of the screen there. Um, we've built this um, toolkit or a bit, we're currently building it into the engagement hub. If you haven't already registered, um, jump in there and, and register and then you'll be able to see these, these uh, or resources, I suppose, become available to you over time. All right. Um, and yeah, look, again, I suppose just to talk about this, one of the things we did want to do is make sure that we had a space for the project and for people to interact, and that is this engagement hub site. Um, so there's a lot of information in there about the different phases of the project um, and also a bit of a map there where you can actually put in different assets that you believe need need assessment. Um, and as I said as well, all the resources around the road manager toolkit. So as I said, if you haven't um, already registered, jump in there and and um, and register. All right, so they're all the pieces of work that we're doing in the project at the moment. Um, just before I hand over to Neil, just um, a quick update to say that um, the current round of work that we're doing um, was uh, meant to be, be finished on the 30th of June. Um, we've actually got an extension of time through to December, so we're going to be doing more work in that time. But the other good news is that the Australian government um, also gave us another $12.1 million to extend this program over the next three years. So I think that's really exciting and I think it's also testimony to the fact that, you know, the the, the Australian government has seen the good work that's been happened. They they believe it's an area of ongoing need. And, and the good thing about this now is that we can continue to support local government in this space over the next three years and really build some, some good capability and get a lot more assessments done. So I think that's pretty exciting to get that ongoing commitment. All right, so um, the other one just to touch on, and I guess this is the really important link. You know, obviously the heavy vehicle national law is what we all operate under, and it clearly lays out you know, the different responsibilities of NHVR, road managers and operators. Um, and in particular, the sections there regarding the various classes of vehicles and the need to obtain a permit for, for uh, operators. Excuse me. Um, so again, in your decision making process, obviously you, you need to um, be aware that as you go through that process that you've got to be satisfied that in granting um, consent that it won't cause damage to infrastructure. And that's a really important one because in a lot of cases we actually don't understand, as I said earlier, the capacity of our infrastructure. So undertaking these assessments really helps to inform that. And that way we're not we're not just relying on you know what's happened in the past is as, as important as that is and it still will be a consideration even when we have done an assessment it just adds another piece of of information for you 
in order to undertake that that decision making process. So it's just being aware of that. That's obviously our overriding legislation that we all follow. But I think it's really important that we undertake these assessments so that we can better inform that process. And as I said, with the system changes, we're making streamline it um, as much as we possibly can. All right, so um, that's about it from my side of things. What I'll do now, I'm just going to hand over to Neil. So I'll just unshare and I'll let Neil um, take control. Over to you, Neil. All right. Uh, can you see that, Todd? Yep. OK, fantastic. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Todd. It's a real pleasure to be here today and welcome everyone. Um, just a bit of background on myself. Uh, I work for the Institute of Public Works and Engineering in Queensland. I'm the director for, uh, for engineering practice there. And I guess my background and history in this uh, bridge assessment space has been fairly long and checkered. Perhaps over the last 15 years, I've had a focus in that, but my career spans much further back than that as well. Uh, perhaps 25 years. And uh, I've done a lot of work, uh, particularly in the Osroad space over the last decade, uh, looking at this issue of, you know, how do we assess the, act, uh, the capability of, of bridges and structures um, to uh, uh, deal with heavy vehicle loads, I guess. So uh, that's, uh, that's sort of been my, my background. And you know, been trying to answer these uh, quite difficult questions of how do we do this in a fairly uh, fast and uh, rapid way, I guess. So what I want to do today is really just take us through what what I'm planning to cover over about the next five, oh, sorry, next four webinars. Uh, and in those four webinars, I really want to address this uh, this issue of bridge assessments and 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 how we can use bridge assessments to make access decisions. Now, this field is reasonably complicated, and my objective is just to try and simplify it down to the basics of what you need to know in order to use some of these more simplified assessment pro uh, processes. And so what's critical there is understanding what you can and can't do in those situations. So I really want to try and focus on that, and, and certainly that's a a core function that I have at the Institute of Public Works. It's uh, my role is really about trying to uh, in, increase um, capability among our members. And so this is the same focus that I have uh, working with the NHVR uh, on this uh, particular project. So we want to really focus on how to make sense of bridge assessments and how uh, to focus on how, how we can undertake that process of making good bridge access decisions. And, you know, those two things are slightly different and we'll, we'll cover that. Uh, so, uh, so these next four webinars, I want to go through these, these basics of bridge vehicle interactions, bridge assessment framework, tier one assessments, and interpreting engineering reports for access decision making. Now, many of you that are on this call, I know that uh, these webinars have been made available to much uh, wider audience than just those participating in this strategic local government assessment program. Uh, but essentially with that program, what you get at the end of it is, you know, sometimes a, a regionally voluminous report that can be quite challenging to understand. Now, in, in those in those reports, there will be assessments at both the uh, what's called the tier one and also the tier two level and which level is used depends on the context and you'll get a series of results for a range of different vehicles. <clears throat> so, you know, if we look at the slide here, you know, we've got I've got three vehicles up there on the left. Those might have been the vehicles that were assessed as part of that program. But then, of course, the inevitable comes along is that the next vehicle that applies for access onto your network doesn't look like those vehicles. Say, for instance, the uh, the cane vehicle that we can see on the right. And we get faced with all sorts of questions like, but that vehicle doesn't look like any of those vehicles. But look, there's a quad axle. None of our vehicles over on the other side have quad axles. So what do we do and how do we make those access decisions? So that's really the core function of what I'll be talking to you over these four webinars. And we need to step through this uh, in, in a very step-by-step -step manner to try and get that understanding needed to be able to apply effectively apply tier one assessments um, to, to make that so uh, to, to make those decisions. 
So to, I'm just going to go through briefly what we'll be covering in each of those at the moment, and then you know more details uh, of each of these sessions obviously will happen during those webinars. But I just want to give you a bit of a taste tester uh, in terms of how I'm trying to put together this sequence um, in the coming upcoming webinars. So the first part is that I want to go through some of the basics of vehicle and bridge interactions. So you know when a vehicle crosses a structure, Obviously, it interacts with that structure and loads it, but that interaction can be quite complex and can be quite uh, context specific. And there are a number of things that are really important that we need to understand to make sure that uh, when we're doing our, uh, our sort of assessments using what we would call tier one assessments to make access decisions, we need to make sure that we've considered some of the things that whether they're you know, applicable in our particular context you know, of the vehicle that we're evaluating. So I want to cover a range of things. Um, first of all, I, I want to really explore this uh, idea of concentration of mass and uh, configurations of vehicles and, and how they compare to each other. Because of course, you know, uh, if we think about what is the uh, the capability of, uh, capability of a bridge to carry loads, you know, just saying, oh, it can carry a 50 tonne load is actually quite inaccurate for most bridges because of course 50 tons is not necessarily 50 tons to a bridge because it all depends on the axle spaces and the masses and the overall concentration of mass in those different axles you know uh, a short span bridge does not feel the same load um, you know uh, from a, a, a 200 ton truck well it may feel the same load from a 200 truck ton truck versus you know, a 20 ton truck, it just depends how long the spans are. So we'll cover a lot of details around that and we'll set up the basis of how we can make good comparisons between vehicles. And this is instrumental in getting to that point where we can do simplified analysis to make our access decisions instead of getting into the really complicated stuff. Uh, we'll also cover, we'll take a look at the uh, dynamic load allowance on bridges. So when a bridge crosses a structure, it makes that structure um, uh, vibrate. And that vibration, if it syncs up with how the truck is, uh, you know, sort of bouncing across the structure, then we can get what's called dynamic amplification of loads. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, and, um, you know, what are fair assumptions to make and, and, you know, where are we sort of straying outside the bounds of, of what's a reasonable call to make on what those factors should be. Uh, we'll also take a look at, you know, what happens when two vehicles cross, um, you know, side by side and how we take that into account in more detailed assessments and how we actually consider that when we get back to a more basic tier one assessment. So we'll, we'll cover all those sorts of things. So that'll be the, the next webinar in line. The one after that, I'm gonna take you through um, a framework to really help conceptualize all the different tiers of assessment and how they go in, how they fit together in an assessment process. Um, this this uh, framework that's being developed as part of this project is a continuation of some of the frameworks that, that I've worked on previously uh, in uh, Osroads projects, but I think that we've come to something that's fairly comprehensive now and really helps guide uh, people through what are appropriate tiers of assessment in different, uh, depending on, you know, the context of the particular situation, what assessment has come before, what information do or don't you have. So this framework will really help put all this together and, uh, and I'll go through that. Uh, I'll also help define the basics of how you would define bridge capability. So this is a very specific term that I use in, in bridge assessment. And essentially what bridge capability is, is the largest vehicle that you can get across the structure safely, right? Now, the, the difficulty is then, you know, that vehicle is, is not necessarily the heaviest. You know, it involves all those parameters that I talked about before, like uh, concentration of mass and, you know, um, different configuration issues, you know, ground contact widths, all this sort of thing. So I want to help take you through the basics of defining bridge capability, because that is the fundamental cornerstone of how we do tier one assessment. We'll learn a bit about the bridge assessment and access terminology that we use in Australia. You can see the um, the text on the left in the table. 
Uh, these are all the different tiers of assessment, and there are a couple of different, um, uh, I guess, groupings of these. You know, we have the PBS tiers of assessment that are in the NHVR um, law, but then we also have bridged asset owners tiers of assessment. And while a lot of these are similar, they don't line up and they use different numbers uh, for different things. Um, even even as far as you know, the bridge access owners tiers of assessment can vary with different jurisdictions. So I want to clear up a bit about that. And I also want to make very explicit what of these are bridge assessment and what of these are heavy vehicle access assessments. And the two things are different. And I just want to really hone in on that point and make it really clear. So we'll cover that in that webinar. Uh, the uh, the second last webinar that I'll be presenting will really focus on this core aspect of tier one assessments uh, and what they are about. We want to get that really comprehensive understanding, particularly because you know it's your gateway into making good access decisions. Uh, but there are a lot of well, they're not a lot of but there are limitations. There are contextual aspects that you have to make sure that you get right to make sure that tier one assessment is valid. Um, and essentially what tier one assessment allows us to do is say, for instance, if the vehicle that we have there on the left, um, if we've done more detailed assessment on that vehicle and we know how heavy that vehicle could be and still allowed to cross the structure, what tier one assessment does is it allows us to compare that vehicle to another vehicle um, that perhaps is a little bit different, but has certain similarities. And so here in this particular graphic, I'm talking about comparing, a, you know, a, you know, obviously a, um, a vehicle that's been assessed with, say, a crane that perhaps is trying to get access to a structure. So I'll talk about the issues of, you know, whether those comparisons are valid and also the very specific process of how you actually do that comparison. And as Todd alluded to, there will be a tool that'll be that that will be made available to road authorities in the near future that focuses on tier one assessment. Uh, and what we want to do is give you the, the fundamentals of how to use that, that tool. Like I, I won't be taking you through the specific use of that particular tool, but I'll be taking you through the basics of what's important uh, and how to actually do tier one assessment. So uh, the last webinar that I'll be presenting will focus on, you know, in this uh, strategic local government assessment program, we have you know, these reports that we get um, and then we need to be able to take that and work out well, what is it that we have um, and how do we use that uh, in making access decisions? You know, how do we use that information to then do good tier one assessments that allow us to make access uh, decisions? And so really what this is, is a combination of the, the preceding three webinars where we should have all of the fundamentals to start you know, critically reviewing those reports and understanding what is it that we actually have and how uh, we can use that to um, to undertake tier one assessments and make good access decisions. Uh, and, and I guess the final part of that is that I want to take you through the beginnings of starting to think critically about access decision making and how we can use judgment to develop better decisions uh, to achieve outcomes. So, you know, for instance, you know, if we place particular restrictions or we control particular risks uh, around access, then perhaps we might be in a position where we can help provide better access uh, as long as there's certain uh, controls in place to manage the risks. And, and I want us to start thinking about that. Uh, you know, in this webinar series, we won't be able to cover every single option and that, but getting the mindset of, you know, trying to help keeping the, the economy moving uh, by, you know, thinking outside the box, you know, um, you know, can be very beneficial to our communities. And so I want to just start touching on that uh, in that particular webinar and start making sense of the information that we get provided. Uh, I think what's also important in that process is also having the tools and understanding to know how to procure bridge assessments, because bridge assessments are not the sort of thing in a council that you're going to be undertaking yourself unless you have very specialised capability within councils. And, and I, I think from my experience, there is very, very limited capability to actually undertake tier two assessments. 
um, and, and certainly tier three assessments within councils. There will be some councils that do have that capability, but there'll be very few. And I think what's really important about um, you know, tier two assessments is it's not something you can get a graduate engineer and say, hey, have a crack at this. You know, for people to be doing bridge assessment, um, there's a lot of technical capability and experience that are needed. And, and really there shouldn't be a situation where you're trying to undertake tier two assessments unless you have someone with, you know, five to 10 years of experience of doing tier two assessments or bridge design um, experience. And so it's not things you should be just trying to do uh, but, you know, having the knowledge and capability of how to go out and get that information and, and um, uh, you know, procure it from a supplier or contractor uh, or a consultant is really important because it's very easy to get information back that you can't actually use uh, in your tier one assessment. So I'll cover a bit of that. Right, so the, the last thing that I wanted to touch on today was talking about level two inspection reports. Now, it can be quite confusing. Uh, you know, we use, uh, we're, I've been talking about tiers of assessment. So we've got a tier one, tier two, tier three assessment. But uh, in parallel to that, we also have level one, level two and level three inspections. So normally when we're talking about inspections, we're using the term level. And when we're talking about assessments, we're talking about tiers. And so it's important just to, to just get across some of this uh, subtle uh, terminology differences. And, and it can be a little bit tricky because say, particularly when we get to the level three inspections, they can involve a lot of aspects of tier three assessments and they can be used interchangeably at times, even though they are different things. But you know, they have a lot of the similar aspects and so people tend to use them interchangeably. So that's the first thing. So levels relate to inspections and tiers relate to assessments. Uh, now, just on inspections. So, so we've got a level one inspection. Now that's an inspection that would often be done in-house. And really this is a maintenance style inspection. What we're doing is just going and, and checking on the structure. We're making sure that it's serviceable, that nothing obviously is wrong with it. We're identifying any maintenance, any minor maintenance, and we carry out those sorts of maintenance activities. So that's what a, a, a level one inspection involves. And when it comes to doing tiers of assessment, it's really important that we have relevant inspections completed to inform those inspections. And I would suggest that T1 inspection, T sorry, level one inspections are not suitable to conduct tier two assessments. I know this can get a bit confusing and I'll get tongue twisted and hopefully I won't make any mistakes along the way. But when we get to something called a level two bridge inspection, what we're doing there is we're actually rating the condition of all of the individual elements of a structure. This is the fundamental uh, um, um, sort of building blocks of any uh, bridge management um, and bridge asset management approach. And so in order to manage your bridges, the, the level two inspections are absolute key to doing that. And uh, as road authorities, we should be doing those across all of our structures. Uh, and, and so in that inspection process, what we do is give every element a condition rating uh, between one and four. Now, this is a very universal process used in Australia these days. Uh, we had some differences in rating systems um, in, in the past, but I think we've sort of unified to this one to four condition rating within Australia. Um, and as part of that process, we also importantly log all the defects. And, and so that's really critical in this process because what we want to do in a level two inspection as it relates to doing tiers of assessment is that we need to understand whether the condition of the structure affects the load carrying capacity. And so to do any tier of assessment without a level two inspection, is really not a good idea. And I would, uh, because it becomes just a purely theoretical exercise. 
And we don't want to know about the theory about whether a structure could carry a load. We want to know whether a structure can carry the load. And absolutely core to that is having these level two inspections undertaken. And, and it was a quite a big surprise to me through this um, strategic local government assessment program, how many situations we had where um, some of the, the, the councils participating couldn't produce level two inspection reports uh, either at all or things that were current. And, and I think this is a really important thing just to touch on because one, it's, it's obviously very important to the bridge assessment process, which is what I'm trying to emphasize at the moment. But I think that there's a much broader issue that really leaves councils very exposed in situations where perhaps something goes wrong, like a bridge fails. Uh, once you get to that situation where something's gone wrong, the level two inspections really are the fundamental building blocks to showing that you have an appropriate asset management process. And so if you're not undertaking those inspections and something goes wrong, it's going to be very, very difficult to show due diligence, uh, you know, when you're in a court of law trying to justify why you've adequately, you know, managed the structure, but it's still fell down. So I, I just wanted to touch on that, just saying, if, if you're not doing level two inspections, you really need to be thinking about how you can get that into your program. And, you know, it doesn't have to be done by external suppliers. You know, you can get people internally trained up. There are courses available that uh, the likes of um, the Institute of Public Works run um, and various others. So uh, I, I would encourage you to have a good look at that if you, you are in an unfortunate position where you don't have uh, level two inspections being done routinely, which is usually every sort of three, three to five years. Uh, so I think that covers the uh, the inspection side of things, uh, and and hopefully we get a bit of an understanding of the difference between levels of inspection versus tiers of assessment. Um, and obviously, I'll run through these a lot more in detail as we move forward in the webinar series. So. That's the that's sort of a good overview of what I want to cover in the next sort of four sessions. But I, I will say that this really is just the start of the process um, to really build your capability and skill in this area and really be able to make good access decisions. Uh, I think we've we've got to be thinking about how we can uh, continually um, you know upskill and train and, and develop understanding in this area. So. Uh, these these courses, this, um, these webinars will give you a good background into that, but I'd encourage you to think about coming along to do further training. Um, there's uh, courses that uh, that IPWEA uh, Queensland runs uh, that you could think about coming along to. These currently are one day courses, um, but we're also looking at uh, other uh, modes of delivery as well, and and what we could do to uh, to assist the people out there, knowing that you know this issue is very uh, a very Australia wide issue. Um, and, you know, we, we want to be here to help. So uh, obviously, if you've got some ideas, um, uh, then yeah, please let me know. Obviously, I can come and do uh, courses face to face with people aside from the courses that we have advertised that are public courses. Um, so, you know, if you have a group of councils that are particularly interested, you know, you can you can engage us and uh, come and do um, those sorts of trainings. So. Uh, there'll be a bit of development in this space over the coming uh, months, I think, but uh, that's still all those details that we worked out. So, yeah, so I think the important thing is, you know, it's not something you can just spend five minutes and go, oh, yeah, that's how you do it. And anyone can just read something and do it. it it's not like that. Uh, we need to become informed about this space uh, to make sure that we're making decisions that keep our, our societies uh, safe. All right, well, that uh, concludes the uh, the webinar today uh, for today. And uh, hopefully that's given you a good background on both the SLAP program and also um, what we'll be talking about over the coming uh, webinars. Uh, of course, you can register in your interest there on the uh, link below. So I think uh, we've got some time for questions, I think. Um, mm. Not sure who I need to hand back to, uh, maybe Todd or Linda. Yeah. That's all right, Neil. Thank you for that. And um, you're you're absolutely right. I think you've you've skimmed the surface of a lot of topics there that I think people are going to be very interested in over the coming weeks. So um, that's a really good intro. So thanks for that, Neil. Um, quick plug there in terms of that next webinar. So webinar number two um, will be this Thursday from 11 to 12 
and that'll be covering basic vehicles slash um, bridge inspections. So please jump in and, and register for that one as well. Um, all right, so I think we had, I, as Neil said, we got a couple of minutes left for some questions. I think we had a comment just come up in the in the list there from Susie. Um, I think, Neil, this is probably in your space regarding the training. Yeah. Um, you need to offer one day course in Victoria and New South Wales as well, not just Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, unfortunately, I do work for uh, yeah. IFWIAC, uh, Queensland, and so that's where those courses are offered. But uh, but we are working on that. We, um, you know, both with uh, NHVR, uh, obviously, and uh, and also with the other uh, um, uh, the other uh, states as well. So mm. we are hoping that, that that will come forward. It's a little bit trying in this current uh, COVID uh, times, uh, getting across borders, that sort of thing can be quite tricky. Um, so we are looking at how we can deal with that issue at the moment. So, you know, mm. uh, just stay posted. And um, But uh, yeah, certainly these webinars are aimed that we're going to do over the next uh, sort of uh, you know, um, few weeks are really aimed at trying to address some of that and get the process started and get get people um, you know uh, some some of the information to start developing those skills. I think. So I just add to that um, Susie and for everyone else I mean obviously there we've seen um, over the past uh, six months or so a lot of interest in in training and certainly in the course that Neil has talked about. Um, Given that we've got this extension of our project, we're looking at how we can uh, provide that training to to local governments. And um, as Neil said, you know we're mindful of the fact that um, unfortunately we're still in a in a pandemic, which is sort of restricting our our travel. But where we can, we'll try and if we're able to get approval for it, structure a program where we can actually come to the you know to the various re regions. Um, and, and deliver the training uh, to you there rather than everyone having to come to Brisbane or Sydney or whatever it might be. So that's something that we're looking at at the moment. We'll certainly let you know how we go with that one. Um, do we have another comment there? Um, yeah, so are there any any other any other questions at all that we have? Either you can put them in the chat or, or otherwise uh, unmute and just um, put it out there. We've got about 10 minutes left. Yeah, no, thanks for your comments there, Susie. Um, agree. And, you know, obviously, you know, we, I'm sure you'd already like more information through this series, but obviously it's something that we need to build over time. I guess the other thing is just to note here, you know, obviously, um, local governments have been doing managing this space and doing heavy vehicle access requests and and to be honest doing particularly given that it wasn't a role that was traditionally performed within local government I think local governments have responded very well and are performing very well in this space but as Neil was saying what we want to try and do is you know create more capability and more understanding um, so that we can do an even better job than we currently are. So obviously better understanding how these assessments are undertaking, how to interpret reports and then apply it to the decision making process is really, really important. So it just adds an extra uh, level of, of confidence, I suppose, to your process. Um, and as Neil was saying, you know, it's all about managing those those risks. So yeah, good start of a good process and hopefully um, I, by the end of this webinar series, you guys will be a lot more informed, but obviously there's still a way to go with it. All right, so um, any other questions that are on people's minds at this point in time? All right, if if uh, we might leave it there then. Um, obviously you can you can uh, lodge any any questions to us afterwards if, if something comes to mind or otherwise we can uh, address those in the next webinar which um, as a final plug is coming up coming up on uh, the 8th of July and yeah we just had a question in terms of registering so um, <clears throat> do we have to register separately for 8th of July um, 
Yes, you do. So what we're doing as as we do each of these webinars, we make the next one available because we're conscious of the fact that people may not be able to commit to the whole series. So what we'd rather do is just do them individually. Um, I'm not sure, Linda, if uh, can people now register for that second one? I know um, I think they're being made available after each one is delivered. Is that correct, Linda? Um. I've actually got the first five webinars now available on the link oh. that you see at the bottom of this slide. And I'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, and additionally, I'll be inviting um, all of you who've been on past webinars to attend any of the future webinars in a part of our promotion campaign. So you will definitely get an invitation. Yeah, and Amelia's just popped it into the into the chat there. Thanks, Amelia, and thanks, Linda. All right, so if there's no more questions, we might leave it there. And thanks very much for attending today. We look forward to you um, being in the next webinar, and um, we'll tell you a bit more about um, vehicle and bridge inspections. So looking forward to that on Thursday. So thanks again for taking the time out to attend today and hopefully we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks very much. See you later. Bye.